Hey everyone, my name is Walker Griggs. I'm an engineer at Mux. Uh, I'm going to do something a little bit out of order here, and I'm going to introduce the punchline for my talk before I introduce the topic. And that punchline is reliable timestamps when live streaming from virtual environments are really, really hard. It seems to be a common theme from today. Uh, and I'm giving this punchline away because this talk really isn't about the conclusion. It's about the story I'm going to tell and how we got there along the way. It's a story of, of a few of our mistakes. It's a little bit about libav audio device decoders and a lot of it about some good old-fashioned detective work. One other piece of framing is up until I joined Mux about nine months ago, I worked with databases. So that was a simpler time for me when whip meant whipped cream and dash was 100 meters. Uh, at that point, I started to realize, though, that video and databases actually had a lot more in common than you might think. They're both sufficiently complex pillars of the modern internet. They both require some degree of subject matter expertise, and at first glance, neither are exceptionally transparent. So that's why this talk is geared for those of us who want to level up our deductive reasoning, uh, maybe add some new triage skills to our tool belt, because in the end of the day, all that really matters is getting there. So where is this talk going? Well, for starters, I have to introduce the problem space uh, and some unexpected behaviors, right? Every story needs an antagonist. Uh, from there, I'm going to take a quick detour to talk about timestamps, um, if that's not drilled into your head by now. I'll use that information to color how we triage the problem and then ultimately go back to that problem statement to talk about how we fixed it. So let's jump right into it. Uh, for, on and off for the last nine months, I've been working on a product called Web Inputs. Uh, Web Inputs takes a web URL as an input and outputs a live stream. URL in, video out. And on the surface, that seems pretty simple, but as most abstractions do, Web Inputs hide some complexity. Wears a lot of hats. Uh, the first thing it needs to do is have some sort of headless browser to do, uh, to do all the client-side interactions. Broadcasting WebRTC is a very common use case here. So um, uh, in this case, the headless browser would need to decode all of those participant streams. Uh, we opted to not use Canvas and instead use X11, uh, which maybe not long for this world, but we need to have some sort of intermediary frame buffers for audio and video. Uh, and then finally, FFmpeg can transcode all of that and stream it out over Mux's standard live stream APIs. Even still, this doesn't show all of the complexity because one of the first things that we had to do was actually change it up so that we could hide the page load from the live stream. Because if you start Chrome, which will immediately start buffering audio and video, and then immediately start transcoding after that, you're going to catch the page load in the output live stream, and that's not a good experience for anyone. So instead, what you can do is listen for some Chrome events, one of which is called First Meaningful Paint. And that's a, basically Chrome's way of saying something interesting is on screen right now. You should probably pay attention. A colleague of mine, Garrett Graves, actually came up with this. And from a timing perspective, it worked really, really well. But this is also where we started to see some funny behaviors. The first of which was that audio and video for the first three to five seconds looked like they were shot from a cannon. Right? Audio is jumping left and right, and video is all messed up. The second behavior is that AV sync would meander throughout the course of the live stream. Maybe 250 milliseconds, but still, no one wants that. Um, shout out to Jonas as well for this test card. Uh, I still hear it in my sleep, so thank you for that. Uh, what did we do? Well, we did what I'm sure all of you are guilty of at one point in time, and we stayed up late fiddling with FFmpeg flags. Right, we tried every different combination of filter and flag. We read every blog post on the topic. Uh, and, and, and the problem with this, as I'm sure all of you are itching to shout out, is it has no evidence. Right? It's just trial and error. Uh, in fact, a, a colleague of mine had a spreadsheet with all the different flags we were using and then subjective scores we gave to each test result. Right? The problem is sometimes we'd get close, and I mean like really, really close, and then one test run would fail, which would reset us back to square one. Uh, another thing to call out here is we were testing in different environments, right? We were comparing behaviors of production against our dev stack. Uh, web inputs is allocated so many cores in production, our entire dev stack runs on that same amount. So it wasn't long before any sort of qualitative assessment started to really show its cracks. Empirical evidence here is and will always be the fastest way to understanding your problem. 
So quick detour to talk about timestamps because clearly they're at fault and that's the first thing that we needed to investigate. We need to get our hands dirty. And I'm pretty sure all of you have this down by now. <laughs> But uh, for the folks in the recording, uh, you'll often hear PTS and DTS talked about, the presentation timestamp and the decode timestamp. Uh, the former is when the viewer needs to have, or needs to show you the fully decoded frame, and the latter is when the player needs to start decoding it. And obviously these are different because some frames are predictive and reference other frames. They're called delta frames. Uh, you need to have that reference fully decoded before you can decode the prediction. So with that in mind, Let's talk about triaging, because one thing we found in our initial investigation was that Pulse Audio was probably doing something a little bit funny here with timestamps. So the first thing we wanted to do was crack open that device decoder and see timestamps as they were being assigned. So we went, we added some new log lines, dumped some new me metrics to disk, and uh, I've cleaned that up so folks in the back don't have to squint too much. The first thing to call out are these non-monotonous DTS in the output stream. These can be the bane of your existence if you're not careful, and they effectively mean that your DTS or your Dakota timestamp is not increasing or progressing by the same amount frame to frame. Sometimes they're going a little faster, sometimes a little bit slower. So that's interesting. Another thing to call out here is we have a huge back pressure of buffered samples, up to 64 kilobytes in size, or not samples, packets. So every time we request a new packet from Pulse Audio, they're enormous. And that eventually settles down to about four kilobytes after the first few seconds, but that's pretty interesting. And the last thing I want to call out here is this PTS and DTS in our logs. Um, audio doesn't form groups of pictures like video does. They don't have predictive frames. So why are we using this here and why are they different? Well, for starters, they're different because uh, if you go look at the LibAV data model, it's generic. It's the same for regardless of codec, regardless of protocol, audio, video. So you can think of the DTS and PTS here, just appropriately typed fields in a struct. Um, but that doesn't explain why they're different. Well, for that, we'll have to look at the pulse device decoder, which does three things when it assigns timestamps to a frame. The first is to just look at the wall clock. Then we adjust that wall clock for latency, where latency is the difference in time between when it was buffered onto pulse and when it was requested by FFmpeg, and then we send that through a denoising filter. And that just smooths out timestamps frame to frame here. And we do this because, well, one, timestamps aren't always reliable, or wall clock specifically isn't always reliable, and two, it's important to call out we're running in a virtual environment, right? We're in a Docker container, which is in a VM, which is probably part of some larger hypervisor. You know, we're probably not getting the benefits of a hardware clock here, so we need to smooth that out. At this point in our investigation, we were feeling good, but I'd say we'd have data, not evidence. Long log files are hard to reason about, and they're not exactly human readable. I'm not a Python developer, but one thing I will swear by is its ability to visualize and rationalize larger data sets. So we normalized this, pruned it down, and fed it into matplotlib. The first thing we'd want to view, of course, are these timestamps. We'd expect them to be linearly increasing with some artifacts from these non-monotonous DTS. And uh, yeah, it's about as much as I expected from that. I, there's nothing to view here. Um, the first time I saw this, kind of did a face palm. Um, what would instead be probably better to look at is the rate of change, right? Because what we really care about is how reliable or consistent these timestamps are. So enter the derivative. Uh, if we take a look at the derivative of our timestamps, these start to tell a different story. So what are we looking at here? For starters, needs a legend, DTS in green, PTS in pink, and this is only the first 10 seconds of that live stream. We've clamped it down to the first 300 frames. After 100 frames or so, well, we start to realize that things look pretty normal. I mean, there's still spikes in the wall clock, but denoising takes away a lot of that edge. The first few frames, those though, those tell an interesting story. So the derivative of a linearly increasing function is flat, and that makes sense in this context. Timestamps should increase by the same amount frame to frame to frame. Those first few timestamps though, anytime our slope is increasing, the gap between timestamps is getting larger, and anytime it's decreasing, they're getting smaller. So I think we've identified uh, the non-monotonous clock here. 
Another thing to call out here is that the denoising filter is doing its job, but it can't spin gold from straw, right? The peaks are lower and the troughs are higher, but it's only as good as the data you feed it. If you think back to those initial logs, though, there was something else in there that might be worth calling out, and those are that back pressure of samples we saw that were stacking up in pulse. If we take a look at the latency, that also tells a pretty convincing story. Not causational here, but there's certainly some correlation, right? We see some large pangs of latency at the beginning of the stream, which settle down into something relatively standard after the first 100 or 150 frames or so. And if we think back to our initial behaviors, well, they start to line up, start to t tell a convincing story. Right? We had this scattered audio for the first few seconds that might be related to these funky timestamps, and then it settles down into something more consistent after the first few seconds. So these graphs are only part of the picture here, and it might be hasty to drop the gavel and blame pulse, but there's a number of unexplored paths, right? This is only the audio encoder, so it's only part of the picture. But like many of you, we were under a uh, little bit of a deadline here, so we had to make a difficult decision. Um, we had some things that we knew. We knew that pulse was starting early, that it was buffering more than we needed, that we didn't really care about anything from before the start of the transcode, so we had to make a difficult decision. Just keep investigating to find the heart of the matter or action what we already knew. We opted to go with the latter. Take it down to first principles and fix it. Before we talk about how we fixed it, it's useful to talk about what we knew. Well, we knew that latency was likely at play and that pulse was buffering more than we needed. We knew that all of our timestamps were based off a wall clock that we couldn't really trust in this environment. And we also know a, useful, uh, a handful of useful metrics for decoding, like our target frequency, the total number of samples, so on and so forth. So with that information, what did we try? The first and very naive solution, but one that we used to validate this hypothesis that pulse was really a problem, was just to only decode those nice round four kilobyte packets, right? That was the magic number that we settled at after a while, but um, you know, this was fine. It, it worked in a controlled environment. I would never want this out in production for very obvious reasons, but it validated the hypothesis. The logical next step here is to flush the pulse buffers. All right, if we think back to our original problem statement here, we're just trying to hide the page load, so anything happening before the start of the transcode can just be disregarded. We found limited success interacting with pulse directly. And the last thing, and the, the, the one that we ultimately went with, was just counting the samples and then calculating our DTS on the fly. The first thing we would have to do there is just draw a line in the sand. Any packet with a DTS, a decode timestamp, before that line in the sand, well, we can just ignore that. That's from before. That's something that Pulse has buffered for us. And then any sample we do care about, well, we can just count those and then start to drive the DTS. So if we know that our target frequency, for example, is 48 kilohertz or 48,000 hertz, and we've already decoded 96,000 samples, that means we're two seconds into the live stream. If we put this into terms that LibAV will understand, it's actually fairly simple. And this gave us really good results. I don't have a graph for it, but if I did the derivative again, it would just be a perfectly horizontal line across the screen. In fact, we were so confident about this that over the next couple of days, we ran a long test stream. We had a customer conference coming up and we ran this as a secondary stream just to see what it was made out of. And what we found throughout the day, millisecond by millisecond, the video pulled ahead of the audio. So what gives? Well, we learned firsthand that when it comes to live streaming timestamps, you can't trust any single method, right? Counting samples is great in theory, but it's not responsive by itself. There are a number of reasons why you might drop samples or hit audio holes, right? Sharks bite cables. And this solution doesn't have any way of, of getting back on track when it does. It just keeps counting. So what is something we can do instead? Well, we could actually use those initial wall clocks as a system of checks and balances here. If we've drifted or we... Uh, have gone too far off in any direction, or if, if we have some sort of threshold that tells us that we're off mark, well, we can resync, reset that initial timestamp and that frame counter. That solution would give us the accuracy of a wall clock, but the precision of sample counting. There comes the time in everyone's presentation where it's important to talk about what you learned. Um, 
for us in this instance, this was one of our first times getting our hands dirty. And we found that in this instance, going through flag by flag wasn't really going to cut it. And when it came down to looking at all the, the information online, there was a big gap between high level glossary and low level specification. Getting our hands dirty, getting hands on, trying things was the only way to fill that gap. Obviously, choose redundancy where it matters. This is something we all know from infrastructure, from databases, so on and so forth. It's the same thing for timestamps. It's not always best to trust a single system when calculating them, so maybe we could look for other alternatives. And then the last one, and something that we actually invested in directly after this work, was investing in glass-to-glass -glass testing because I wasted far too many hours watching test cards and Big Buck Bunny and my palms still get sweaty. Um, one thing we, we tried doing was in, uh, injecting QR codes directly into live streams or test cards and then overlaying some sync pulses in the audio. Run that through web inputs, analyze the output. If the waveform, if those pulses land on the frames that we'd expect, we're good and we can actually start to calculate how those deviate. So that's what we learned. But I think the ultimate takeaway here and the one that I told you was coming from the very beginning are that reliable timestamps and live streaming in virtual environments are really hard. Thank you. Mm -hmm.